welcome students to another class of youtube live classes this is nivedita naik of kalikot higher secondary school and the topic of discussion for today is from unit 5 which is population interactions so population interactions we will again study under ecology in the previous class we discussed about what are what is ecosystem and what is the adaptations found in different plants so today we shall discuss what is population interaction as we know we can never imagine of a habitat which is without another species or just a single species so actually even a single species if it is present will at least need one of the one more organism on which it can feed so in any habitat the organisms cannot live in isolation all the organisms should exist in a network of interactions with other species so if we consider any animal an animal needs food so that should be another organism on which it can feed if we consider even the autotrophic plants that are present the autotrophic plants can prepare their own food from the raw materials like carbon dioxide water using sunlight but they also require soil microbes which are present in the soil to decompose the organic matter and make available different inorganic nutrients that can be absorbed by the root of the plants so it is now obvious that in nature animals cannot ever live in isolation and they should always exist in a network of interactions for other species so why these interactions occur these interactions between the two organisms can occur for either getting food or for a space to live or any other requirement so they will be interacting with each other and when we come to such interactions the interactions can be actually beneficial it can be detrimental or harmful or neutral for one or both the organisms so the interactions can be beneficial harmful detrimental or neutral so this type of interactions that we see can be can be found in nature and this interactions can be divided into different types depending upon whether the organisms are actually benefited whether they are harmed or it is a neutral type of interaction so we can discuss some main of type of interactions so first type of interactions let us take two species that are interacting one is species a the other is species b and what happens in such a interaction that can be seen what is the effect and what is the name of the interaction so i will be representing if species a is benefited by a plus sign if it is harmed by a negative sign and if it is a type of interaction which is neutral we can denote it by zero so let us first see one of the interaction so here the interaction name first we take is mutualism so mutualism is an interaction which can be denoted as where both of them are benefited from the interaction so species a is benefited species b is also benefited so the name of such an interaction is mutualism both of them are equally benefited from the interaction then we take species a is benefited species b has it has a negative impact on species b and here the type of interaction can be predation where one animal is eating another animal so it is predation type we'll come to the next interaction again species a is benefited species b is more harmed 
and this type of interaction can be parasitism. One is dependent on the other, one derives benefit from the other species, in turn the second species is harmed, so it can be parasitism. There can be an interaction where both of them are fighting and both of them will have negative effects, so this type of interaction can be named as competition. In another type of interaction, species A can be benefited, species B will not have any effect, so we can denote it by zero and this type of interaction can be written as commensalism. So in today's class, we will be discussing about these interactions which is mutualism, predation, parasitism, competition and commensalism with suitable examples and we can see how the species are so well linked with each other and they are able to survive in nature. So this is the different type of interactions that we shall see today. So today first let us take the interaction which is known as mutualism. So mutualism here is what type of interaction? So mutualism is association between two species in which both the species are benefited from each other by the interaction. So where we can find mutualism? We can find mutualism in all many plants, animals as well as microorganisms. So this type of interaction can be sharing of resources or for providing services to get the benefit. So there can be two types of interaction. So the interaction can be for sharing of resource or it can be for providing any service to get the benefit. So let us take certain examples to understand mutualism more. The first simple example is pollination by flowers or pollination of flowers by the insects or other organisms. So pollination as we know is the transfer of the pollen from one flower to another. So it is a part of sexual reproduction process in the plants. So during this pollination process, the pollen has to be transferred. When there is cross pollination, the most significant agent that helps in pollination are different types of insects like butterflies and bees and here how does it affect the process of mutualism. So during pollination of flowers by insects like butterflies and bees, the pollinator which is the insect receives a resource. That resource is a food resource and it receives nectar and pollen as food. So here there is resource sharing. The plant in turn gets its pollen dispersed from one flower to another by the help of the insect. So here the it gets a service from the pollinator. So the service is dispersal of pollen from one flower to another. So here when we come to the pollination of flower, we see the flowers actually have bright colors, they produce lots of nectar or they produce edible pollens to actually attract the pollinating agents like your butterflies or bees. So here there is an evolution where we see that flowers are also modified or adapted to attract the different type of insects. So pollination of flower is a classical example of mutualism. The resource is shared by the plant and the service is got from the pollinator. So next example for mutualism let us take is the symbiotic nitrogen fixing rhizobium and the root of legumes. So when we come to the symbiotic nitrogen fixation, the symbiotic nitrogen fixation, we, as we know some of the bacteria present in the soil are able to fix atmospheric nitrogen. Nitrogen is an essential element for 
the plant growth. So it is a macronutrient that is very essential. We know nitrogen is a part of the chlorophyll molecule. Nitrogen is important for the nucleic acid. So nitrogen is one of the most essential nutrients required by any plant. So here rhizobium bacteria is a nitrogen fixing bacterium present in the soil. So many of the leguminous plants, they show mutual association with these bacteria. And leguminous plants, you have soybean, you have different pulses. So they form root nodules. The rhizobium bacteria enter into the plant root and they form root nodules. What does the bacterium do? The bacterium fixes atmospheric nitrogen for the plant because it has a special type of enzyme called nitrogenase enzyme which can convert atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia. So the host plant provides oxygen and car carbohydrates which provides energy to the bacteroids or the group of bacteria that live inside the root nodules. So you can see how root nodules are formed in the leguminous plants. So here you can see root nodules forming in leguminous plants inside which we can find the rhizobium bacteria. So this is another example where we find mutualistic association. And in mutualism, the association of both the organisms are essential for the survival and to the benefit of both of them. Let us take another example. This example is a composite organism called as the lichens. So lichens represent the intimate relationship between an alga and a fungus. So when we compare these two organisms, the alga and a fungus, the algae are all chlorophyllous and photosynthetic. Whereas we know the fungus do not contain chlorophyll. They have heterotrophic mode of nutrition. So here, the algae and the fungus, they form a composite organism. They live together in many cases, and they form a type of organism called the lichen. So here you can see the lichen and its internal structure. So these are lichens that are grow on the bark of many plants or on some moist surfaces. The internal structure, if you see the internal structure, the hypha of the fungus, the green parts show the algae which are present inside the hyphae of the fungus. So the body of this structure is made by the fungal hyphae, whereas the photosynthetic algae are present living inside. So what happens in such association? Here the algal partner mainly belongs to cyanobacteria which we commonly say the blue green algae or the green algae and the fungal partner belongs to the group of ascomycetes or basidiomycetes group in fungus. So algal partner, what does the algal partner? This do the algal partner is called the phycobiont. This phycobiont produces food as it is able to photosynthesize. It contains chlorophyll and makes available this food to the hypha of the fungus. What does the mycobiont do? The mycobiont is the fungal partner. As it forms the body of the lichen, this mycobiont absorbs water and minerals and also provides a living space for the lichen. So this is another example where we see the algae and fungus living together, both of them required for their survival and both of them helping each other as partners. The algae producing food by photosynthesis and the fungus making available water and minerals for pro producing this food. So this is another example of lichen. So in nature, we can have so many other examples, many other examples that also show mutualism, like you also have the mycorrhizal association. 
So mycorrhizal association is again the association of the fungus with the roots of higher plants. Some of the higher plants like pinus, they do not have root hairs which can absorb water and mineral. So the fungal hyphae are twined around the roots and they absorb the water and minerals, make it available to the root. In turn, the root cells provide them with energy rich carbohydrates for their survival. So let us now come to the second type of interaction. The second type of interaction is predation. So So what is predation? So predation here is the capture of living animals for food. Why it has to capture living animals? So we know that the higher plants or the autotrophic plants are able to prepare their food. And this is the first source of food for any organism on the earth. And the what will happen if all the energy that is fixed by the plant is not used up? So there are certain or animals that feed on the plants. We know they are called the herbivores which graze or browse on the plants and eat the leaves of the plants as their food. So these herbivores are then eaten by the larger animals or the carnivores which are the flesh eating animals. So here predation is the capture of live animal for food. Predator is called the hunter organism while the prey is the attacked organism. So in an ecosystem we can easily see the predators are mainly carnivores. They include your animals like lion, tiger, fox, shark, lizard, snake, eagle, etc which feed on either the herbivores or smaller other carnivores. So very often in a food chain that we see where one animal is eating another animal, the predator can also be another organism's prey. For example, a frog which can feed on insect, the frog will also become a prey for a snake or an eagle. So a predator is often another organisms prey. A predator sometimes is at the top of a food chain and is not preyed upon by any organism. Such large predators which are not fed upon are called as the apex predator. Example, your whale or a tiger is an apex predator. So what happens to the apex predator is that they either die by some natural cause, by old age, by illness or their number is actually much less in the entire ecosystem. So this is the predator and sometimes even we have few carnivorous plants which are also predators. Example, Nepenthes, Drosera, they are all carnivorous plants which are the predators. So let us see some examples of predators and the ecological significance of predation. So here we see some examples of predation where a tiger is feeding an another small animal, the kite is feeding on a mouse, the spider is catching an insect and the grizzly bear has a seal. So here these are examples of predation that we come across in nature. And we shall see now what is the ecological significance of predation. So ecological significance of predation. Predation is an important interaction. So what does the predation method actually carry out and why it is significant in the ecosystem? The first significance will be that the eco predation actually helps to transfer the energy from one trophic level to another trophic level. So here we can see that the green plants are 
the autotrophs. So autotrophic plants or the green plants are able to synthesize food and from sunlight raw materials like carbon dioxide and water and they have a storehouse of food. So this food has to be utilized by some other organism. So in the food chain we see it is used by the herbivore and the herbivore is eaten by a carnivore. So here there is predation. So what is happening in this predation is the energy here is transferred from autotroph to the herbivore and then the carnivore. These are the consumers, the autotroph is the producer. So energy is being transferred from the autotrophic organism to the herbivore or the different other carnivores. So predation helps in transferring of energy from one trophic level. One trophic level is the level in which the food is got by the organism. So here the food is energy is being transferred from one organism to another by predation and then the second significance, the second significance here is that predation helps to control the prey population. Control the prey population. It helps to control the prey population. So we can know that the prey population has to be controlled. For example, in a grassland, if the, there are lots of deer and no predator to feed uh, over the deer, then the amount of grass will also one day decline and the prey population, the deer will also decline because it will not be getting any food. So in any ecosystem, even a, in a forest, so in a forest you will find that the predator has to be present so that the number of individuals of the prey do not dominate any ecosystem. So that will be much devastating for the ecosystem. So here the predators, the third significance is the predators prevent always a single species from becoming dominant because a predator will not be feeding on only one prey. It will be feeding on a number of different preys so that the number of each prey is balanced in the ecosystem. So it has an important role in maintaining a balance of organisms in an ecosystem. The another important significance of predation here which sometimes goes unnoticed is the predation force or predation type of interaction is a major selective force for what? Now for re removing the diseased, old and injured individuals. For example, when we see it, the tiger feeding on the deer, we all find that it will be first capturing an animal which is old, which is not able to run properly, which is either injured or it is diseased. So it is a major selecting force where the number of individuals that are diseased, old or injured can be easily removed from the population of the prey. Sometimes in some cases even the young ones are removed because there is large number of young individuals in the population of the prey. So it becomes a major selective force in removing the diseased, old and the injured individual. So what happens in predation is it is significant for the process of balancing the ecosystem in nature. Sometimes in during predation the prey also modifies itself or to prevent itself being attacked by its predator. So some of the organisms like your frog or your lizards, they change their color according to their environment. Their 
camouflage because they cannot be seen by their predator. So that is another method by which some of the prey they try to protect themselves from the predator. Even the plants like cactus they modify and have spines so there will be no grazing animal feeding on the cactus. Another weed example is Calotropis. This Calotropis plant produces highly poisonous cardiac glycosides so there will be no cattle or goat or any other grazing animal that will feed on Calotropis because they know that it is poisonous. The monarch butterflies that are present are also very distasteful. They do not have a good taste. So the birds do not feed on them and they have specific chemicals that they receive during their larva stage from the plant. So here there are also some methods that the prey adapt to protect themselves from predation. So this is the second type of interaction that we have studied where one organism feeds on the other. So the third type of interaction, coming to the third type of interaction, it is known as competition. So what is competition? So it is an interaction between two or more organisms for using the same resources. So resources again can be food, your place to live, so there will be competition. So competition is a fight. So competition is a fight for the same resource that sometimes mainly is limiting or it is found in a fixed amount or in a limited amount. So there will be two organisms that will be fighting for the same resource. So there can be sometimes the various resource for which competition occurs in space includes food, includes light. So in competition, the fitness of the individual of one species is invariably lower than that of individuals of the same or different species. So when we are comparing two different species, the individuals of one species will be automatically more stronger or more fit than the individuals of the second species that is present during competition. So competition here we can divide them into two types. One is called as the interspecific competition and the other is called as intraspecific competition. So inter is in between. So interspecific competition is the competition occurring between two different species and intraspecific competition is the competition occurring between the individuals of the same species. Let us now see what is the difference between interspecific competition and intraspecific competition. See, here you can see the differences between interspecific competition and intraspecific competition. So interspecific competition can be defined as the competition between the members of different species for the shared resource, the resource that they are sharing, the food that they are going to share. For example, then when two different species individuals fight for the same food, then it becomes interspecific competition. In intraspecific competition, the definition is that it is a competition between the members of the same species for limited resources. Normally, when the individuals of the same species are fighting, the resource is limited. Otherwise, they can be freely getting the resource and they will not fight among themselves. So whenever intraspecific competition is occurring, the Competition is between the members of the same species for 
the limited resource that is present in the area. So, the competition for interspecific competition, this competition occurs for a specific requirement. They may not be fighting for all the requirements because two different species will have different requirements. So, there can be one common specific requirement for both of them. So, they may fight for that specific requirement that occurs in interspecific competition. But when we come to the intraspecific competition process, here the individuals belong to the same species. That means the all their requirements will also be the same, same space or habitat, same food and same type of foraging pattern or eating pattern, for same type of reproduction pattern. So, here the requirements of this species is the same when it comes to intraspecific competition. So, here the fight will be occurring for all the requirements of the species, whereas in interspecific competition, the requirement or the competition was for some specific requirement, for example, a food, for example, in plants it can be for light. So, there will be interspecific competition. Coming to what happens when there is interspecific competition, either both or one of the species can be suppressed due to competition. The competition can be such that both of them, both the species or one of the species which is inferior or which is not so fit to compete can be suppressed due to the competition. But when there is intraspecific competition, we know they belong to the same population of the same species. So, it will invariably affect the population size and composition. If there is fighting for the same resources that is present, requirements that is present, so many individuals may be wiped out by intraspecific competition. So, intraspecific competition also helps somehow to control the population size and composition of that species in a given area. So, these are the basic differences between interspecific and the intraspecific competition. So, here we can see some interspecific competition the lion, the cheetah or the fox, the wolf, they are waiting for the same predator food. So, there is interspecific competition. So, here in the second picture, we can see that there are different plants, they are intertwined, they are trying for to get much amount of light and so there is competition of light in the for between the plants. Here intraspecific competition. So, here intraspecific competition. Here we can see the pack of dog where they are not allowing another member from outside to enter because they will be having competition for the same requirements, same food, same place to live. So, there can be intraspecific competition. Here the germinating seeds again all of them will not survive because they will be absorbing the same nutrients, they will be fighting for light. So, there will be intraspecific competition. So, all these germinated seedlings will not survive, only a few of them will survive. As we see, the plant produces, normally plants produce large number of seeds because some of the seeds may not germinate, some of the seeds will get wiped out by intraspecific competition. So, only some of them can survive the competition. So, this is intraspecific competition. So, in, in the process of competition, there is a principle called as the principle of competitive exclusion or the Gauss principle. What does this principle state? This principle states that two closely related species competing for 
the same resources cannot coexist indefinitely and eventually the species which is least susceptible to food shortage or which can adapt easily to the change environmental condition will survive and the inferior one is eliminated. This was known as the principle of competitive exclusion. One will be excluded when there is competition between two closely related species. So here competition is also important in nature. Why it is important? Because as we know there is evolution in the process, evolution in nature. So the survival of the fittest is a common theory and this competition is essential to wipe out the inferior or the unfit and may allow the, the superior forms or the most adaptable forms to come up in nature when environmental conditions change. But sometimes in competition, competition always does not wipe out an organism. Sometimes there is also resource partitioning or there is division of resource between the two competing organisms. They get modified in a manner that they partition the resource and use the resource at different times. So there will be coexistence again between the two competing organisms. So by changing their feeding habit or by changing their feeding time. So Mac Arthur found that five different types of warbler birds living in a tree they could coexist with each other because they modified their foraging pattern. What is foraging pattern is eating pattern and what they feed and on what insect they are going to feed. So when there is resource partitioning the organisms can also sometimes coexist with each other. So this is the interaction of competition where we normally say that during competition both the organisms are changed or both the organisms are harmed by the competition. Coming to the next part type of interaction, the next type of interaction is the parasitism. So parasitism is a very commonly found interaction between two different organisms. In parasitism there are two terms, one term is the host and the other is the parasite. So who is the host and who is the parasite? The organism that allows another organism to survive on it is called as the host and the organism that lives inside or over the host body is called as a parasite. So this is a host and parasite relation in which the host is harmed and the parasite is benefited from this association. So this is parasitism. So parasitism is again can be defined as the interaction in which two organisms interact, one is the host, one is the parasite. The host makes available all the resources to the parasite. The parasite uses the resources and it survives in the on the host body. So here the host is harmed, it loses and the parasite gains. So this is the interaction called as the parasitism. So parasitism, in parasitism we can discuss what are the common things or characters of parasitism. So parasitism is a type of close association between two different species in which one species is harmed and the other is benefited from the association. So who is benefited? is the parasite who is losing or harmed is called the host. Generally always a parasite 
is smaller in size on the host and these parasites can be of two types they can be obligate parasites or strict parasite they will not be able to survive without the host and it can also be a facultative parasite which temporarily becomes a parasite for fulfilling some of the requirement so parasites generally weaken the host body they cause different types of diseases in the host we see that many fungi bacteria or the microbes are parasites on different plants and different animals so parasitism is a type of interaction where one is benefited and the other is harmed so coming to the types of parasites these parasites can be termed as ectoparasites and they can also be termed as endoparasites let us first see what are ectoparasites ecto means outside or over so these are parasites that live on the outer surface or over the body out, outer surface of the host body we have seen common examples we know common examples of ectoparasites the ticks that are present on a dog's body or on the cattle skin the louse are present on the head of humans in between the hair the leeches and also plants like cascuta and loranthus so they are examples of ectoparasites which are present over the surface or outer surface of the host body so these parasites also modify themselves and they have certain adaptations for example the ticks and lice have mouth parts to suck blood from the host body the leeches which get attached over the skin of the cattle or over the human body these leeches draw blood or suck blood and how they have a continuous supply because these leeches secrete anticoagulant to maintain a continuous flow of blood and the other adaptations that can be seen here is many of them lose their digestive tract they easily absorb food from the host body they have adhesive structures by which they can attach and they have high reproductive capacity to again multiply their number so the parasitic these are some of the ectoparasites that we can see which get attached to the skin or the body of other organisms cascuta is a example of a plant parasite cascuta here is a total stem parasite without any leaf and it twines around the host stem as you can see in the figure and it sends specific tissue called hostorial tissue or the sucking tissue which penetrate the body of the host moves up to the conducting tissue that is the xylem and absorbs water and minerals and food from the host so cascuta is a total stem parasite that we see on many plant body orobanche is another plant species commonly known as broom rape it is a root parasite which attaches its root to the host root like legumes your sunflower plants commonly found in the fields so here you can find you in the figure that the parasitic root of orobanche gets attached to the host root and it absorbs the food from the host plant so orobanche is a menace in the field because it takes up nutrition from the your field crops that like the legumes so these are examples of the ecto parasites these are some of the examples of endo parasites these parasites live inside the body of the host animals and they are called as the endo parasites so most of these endo parasites can be found in the digestive tract 
circulatory system, even the respiratory system of the animals and humans. So, they are endoparasites. So, parasitism sometimes can also be brood parasitism or social parasitism. The, for example, we can take the example of the cuckoo and the crow. So, parasites here, we know the cuckoo is a parasite, it does not build its nest, it lays eggs in the nest of the crow and the crow mistakes the eggs of the cuckoo to be its own and here the eggs are such modified that the crow is unable to figure out that it is not its own egg. So, this type of parasitism is called as brood parasitism found in some of the animals. So, let us now come to the next type of interaction which is commensalism. So, commensalism is a close association between two different species in which one species is benefited, one species is benefited and the other is not affected. So, the benefited organism is called the commensal and the other is called the host which is neither harmed nor benefited. So, commensalism is a type of interaction of two organisms where one of the species is benefited from the association and the other species which is your host is neither harmed nor benefited. So, let us see some common examples of commensalism. Examples of commensalism we can see the cattle and the ergot relation. In many grasslands and even in the fields we can see that when the cattle, the cow or is grazing there we find the small birds of ergot also following the cattle in the field. So, wha what happens during this relation is that when it is feeding, when the cow is feeding, they eat the grass and the insects are e exposed. So, the birds can easily catch hold of the insect as their food. The next example is your remora and shark relation. Remora fish are small fish as you can see in the figure. They are attached over the body of the shark. So, they are able to move to longer distances and they consume the food that comes out from the jaws of the shark. So, they are benefited, but the shark is not harmed. The example here of a plant which are epiphytes, epiphytes are small plants growing on the branches of large trees. These epiphytes have epiphytic root or the aerial root that has a spongy tissue called the velamen tissue which is hanging and this velamen tissue absorbs water and minerals from the atmosphere. Here it is taking the help of a tree branch but it is in no way harming the tree and so it is an example of commensal. So, here today we have discussed the different population interactions. So, different population interactions we have discussed where some of the interactions were, some of the interactions were beneficial, some of the interactions were harmful and some are neutral type of interactions. So, these interactions are essential for the ecosystem to balance itself, different types of organisms to live together and to give different types of benefits to one another and also survive in nature. So, it also helps in the process of evolution as we can see during competition they develop different types of adaptations to outcome one other species. The parasites get modified to live inside the body of another organism. Mutualistic association take the help of each other, they benefit both and the commensalism one allows the other to take the help but is not harmed or benefited. 
So from this portion of population interactions, you will be getting the short questions of what type of interaction it is, some examples of interaction and the definitions of different types of interaction. So thank you all for listening patiently to today's class. Let's meet in the next class with a different topic. Thank you all.